I've made it through part one of Our Share of Night. I am 139 pages in. And before we get too far into this update, I will say I obviously look very different right now. <laughs> I'm really trying out the middle part thing. I don't know. And my hair's curled for the first time in at least a year. I haven't had my hair curled since wedding season last year and i got a new curling iron and i was trying it out so you know it's different we look different right now but it's it's fine did i do the best job no because i usually use a curling wand that gets like thinner at the bottom i'm trying out a regular curling iron i don't know i'm learning but hopefully i'll get better eventually but for the book I am really pulled into this story so far. I feel like it is more character driven than I expected it to be. It is also very plot driven. It is a good balance of character and plot. The setup of the story so far for what you get in part one is you are mainly following a father, Juan and his son, Gaspar. And you know that Juan's wife and Gaspar's mother, Rosario, has recently passed away. And now Juan and Gaspar are on the road. They seem to be kind of running from slash towards towards something. And I really like the way the first part of the story is told because you don't always know what they're doing on this journey. And then later by the end, it'll get explained later. And you're like, oh, that's what that scene was. Or like, oh, that's why he did that thing, which I really, really like in storytelling where it's a lot of, you know, just showing you all these things and it's not spoon feeding you everything. And so there were points where I would feel confused and I would be like, wait, am I missing something? Who's this person? Why are we doing this thing? And it was really really satisfying to get to the end of the first part and have all those aha moments where you're like ah oh okay yeah I see and it just builds the exposition of Juan and Gaspar's story really really well without just info dumping at you which I think this book could have easily done and I'm very glad that it did not because there's a lot going on in the story there's a whole world to build there's a whole cast of characters there's all this exposition there's all of these secrets and motivations and it feels like a lot but I really like like the way that it is unfolding in the story so far. To give you a little more context on what the story is about without spoiling anything, this is laid out in the synopsis. There is this cult basically that is carrying the story and they're called The Order. And Juan played a critical part in that cult as did his wife. His wife's parents are like high leading orders of the organization and he is an important role in the organization because of the powers that he has. He is a medium who can contact the darkness which is what this cult believes in. And Juan is really really worried about trying to protect his son Gaspar because he's starting to see signs that Gaspar may also possess that power and if he does the organization is going to want to take Gaspar and uh, do some not great things to utilize him. With that setup, a lot of the first part of this story is just a really beautiful portrait of a dad trying to protect his son and they're going on this journey together and you're meeting all these other people who are involved in other ways and there's a lot of questions about this organization, about his part in it, his family's part in it, and just all what's going on around it. And it is creepy. So that's where we left off in the first part. The next part of the story, and I've seen that the parts kind of jump around a lot, the next part of the story is going to be two years in the future in the same place. Part one was set in Argentina in 1981 and part two is set in Argentina in 1983. So we're getting a little bit of a jump to the future. I have a suspicion of what I think could happen to propel the story forward and where we're going to be picking up, but I don't know. I could be completely wrong because I really don't know where the story is going to go. I know parts of it are also going to take place in London. The range of the years through the story is pretty large, so I'm really just going on a journey with it. But I would say for part one, I am pleasantly surprised so far. I'm enjoying it more than I thought I would. I mean, I always thought I was going to enjoy it, but I always worry with a longer book that, oh, is it going to be like wordy? And then you have a long ways to go and it's kind of a drag to get through. I am fully invested in this. I'm also loving the audiobook. I think the audio narrators did an excellent job bringing the story to life too. So I'm really liking doing a paired experience of the audio and the physical copy. And I'm just excited to move into part two and see what happens next. I 
have now made it through parts two and three. I am at page 307 and I'm getting ready to go into part four. And I was going to give individual updates for each part, but part two was really, really short and then part three was long. So I just decided to combine them in updates. Part two was only 20-ish pages, I think. And it took place two years after part one, but not a lot actually happened in part two. You just got a different character's perspective reflecting on Juan when he was a child and how he came in to be the person that he is to this cult order thing. There was a nice creepy scene in that too. So far the horror has been pretty light throughout the story. You just get some scenes every now and then where you're like, ooh, that's nice and creepy. And honestly, part two in itself kind of felt like it could stand as a short story on its own and be a good horror short story, which I know this author does do short stories and short story collections. But anyways, part two was fine. Not much to say about it. Part three was much longer. It was very long and it spanned two years. Part two took place in 1983. Part three took place from 1985 to 1986. So far the narrative has flowed really seamlessly across these parts, even though you get different kind of characters that you're close to, not necessarily necessarily POVs because it's all been written in third person, I'm pretty sure. It's kind of hard to remember that sometimes. You don't notice that as much when you're reading, at least I don't notice that as much, but I'm pretty sure it's been third person the whole time. But part one, you were really close to Juan and understanding his mindset of protecting his son. Part two, you got a little bit of a different character POV for a very brief amount of time. Not POV though, character that you're closest to. And then part three really gives you time to get to know Gaspar and to see him interacting with a friend group and to really start to see his perspective on his relationship with his dad because it is a lot more complex than it seems when you're closest to Juan's perspective. And things start to get darker in part three and it leans a lot more into horror in part three. So far I'm still really enjoying the book although I just feel like it didn't need to be this long but I always feel like that. I always feel like movies don't have to be as long as they are, books don't have to be as long as they are. Particularly I think that's on my mind because I just went to go see the new movie Bo is Afraid today which is a three hour film that feels three hours long and that's sort of how I feel about this book is especially part three was really long and as I'm approaching the end of it I'm like did part three have to be this long because it does feel a little bit repetitive of the cycles of the things that are happening as Gaspar is developing friendships and as he is having increasing tensions with his father and his father is still not doing well medically and that causes issues with them and then there's this horror aspect that's coming into it as well and it did just feel a little bit repetitive because you really could feel what we were building up to for the end of part three. And at a certain point, you're like, okay, let's get there. Let's see where the story moves after that point, which now we're going to do because what I suspected was happening in part three is what was happening. And that's about all I can say without spoilers so far. But yeah, still enjoying it, still having a good time. And if you want some spoilers, I'll dip into spoilers for a little bit. And if you don't, you can skip on to the next section when I'll be talking about part four. I try to not compare every horror story that I read to a Stephen King but something about reading about a group of kids and just the creepy things going on around them really just feels like Stephen King to me. And part three was especially reminiscent of that. Some new characters that you get introduced in this part are Pablo, who is a boy who kind of has a crush on Gaspar, but nothing's really happening with that yet. Adela, who is missing part of an arm and she gets this storyline about phantom pain and Gaspar kind of has a crush on her and he does this really cool thing of like building her this box with a mirror in it so that she can trick her brain and like scratch the itch of her phantom pain which was a really sweet little moment. Her dog also goes missing in this part. I think it was her dog and Gaspar wants to help and he asks Juan to do some clairvoyance to try to locate the dog because the dog is dead and then they're able to go find the dog and so you're starting to understand Juan's powers a little bit more. You're seeing Gaspar have some crushes for the first time. It's very much like a coming of age with a friend group and then there's also a girl named Vicky and I just had to reference my notes to remember what is significant about Vicky. And the only thing I remember being significant about her is she's actually the one whose dog went missing. It wasn't Adela. It was really nice 
nice to see Gaspar start to develop some of his own personality in the story. You start to understand the complex emotions that he has for his father and he really holds a lot against him because of just the way that they live and the way his dad will be mean sometimes. And gosh, there was a line that I wish I would have marked where it was. And I'm gonna butcher the paraphrasing. If I can find it, I'll replace this, but I don't think I'm gonna be able to find it. But there was something that Gaspar is thinking and, and something was happening in the storyline. I don't even remember what was happening, but he has this thought about how people have this idea around sick people because his dad's in the hospital a lot in this part. And he's, he's thinking like people think sick people are all this way, but really they can just be so mean because they just want you to be suffering along with them. And like, that's how he views his dad is he has a lot of pent up resentment for the way his dad treats him because his dad is trying just so hard to protect him. And that's what you know, because you got so much of what was in Juan's head in part one, but the way Gaspar is experiencing that is all of the negative sides of an overprotective parent. And then also a ill parent who is really suffering a lot throughout the story with his heart condition and he's just tired all the time and really just struggling to get through and ends up having some less than wonderful moments, especially a moment where he gets angry at Gaspar and he shoves his arm through a window and then like scrapes it around the glass and really messes up his arm. And that was a brutal scene to read. I had my AirPods in, I was listening to it on audiobook and I was just sitting there like, oh, just cringing because that was a rough scene to read. So there's like some human elements of horror that are coming into the story about this relationship between the father and the son and these brutal things that are happening between them. Part three is really all about this lead up to Juan dying. You feel very certain that that is what we are leading to. He's getting worse and worse and everyone's kind of coming around to accept that Juan's about to die. Gaspar's friend's parents are kind of telling their kids like, hey, you need to be nice to him. Like his dad's about to die. Everyone kind of knows what's going on here. You as the reader obviously know what's going on. And Gaspar himself knows what's going on. And he even has a moment where he wishes his dad would just go ahead and be dead so that he didn't have to deal with him anymore, which is really, really heartbreaking. There's also an interesting scene in here where Gaspar comes to, there's a lot going on, like he's about to die. Uh, Esteban slash Steven, who is a friend of Juan's, who is, you know, more than a friend for sure, comes because he's going to kind of help take care of Gaspar once Juan dies. And there's this moment where they're like, go into the hospital or something. And Gaspar just comes to, and he's severely injured. He's in the hospital and everyone's telling him that he got in a car accident on the way to where they're going, but he has no memory of it. And for some reason, he feels like his father was trying to hurt him. And then he's just paranoid. He doesn't want to be around any of them. I don't really think you know what happened there fully. I'm curious if we're going to get more answers about that. But there's just a lot that was going on in this part. There was also something earlier in part three where Gaspar's friend Pablo was coming over to his house and walked in on Juan doing this ritual thing with, I'm pretty sure it was Esteban that he was doing it with, where there was like a circle of candles and blood and creepy things going on. And I don't, I don't know where it's going. <laughs> I looked back at the synopsis and it says that this cult, the order, their goal is to seek eternal life. And for some reason, I forgot that people mentioned vampires with this book, but the vampire-y things kind of are starting to come in through this part too. Like there's a moment when Juan takes Gaspar's arm and shoves it through the window and then he like licks his blood. And then you're thinking, oh, interesting. Like what's going on with that? And the rituals that Juan is doing, seems like he's like getting power from other people. Is that helping him sustain longer life? Obviously not because he dies at the end of part three, <laughs> but there's something going on with that part two. And then at the end of part three, the kids are all going into this creepy house on the street. And part three was actually called the bad thing about empty houses. There's this empty house on the street that they all think is creepy. The kids go into it. And then Adela ends up going missing when they go in the house. She walks through a door and she does not come back. So now she's missing. And part four, what we're about to jump into is a little bit in the future, I think. Oh, actually it's gonna go in the past, what we're about to read. Interesting. So part three was from 1985 to 1986 in Buenos Aires, and part four is going to be 1960 to 1976. So a really long time span, but in the past. So I don't know what we're following. I don't know what's gonna happen about that girl going missing in the house and if we're ever going to follow back up on that. But part three, I did think was solid. It was just a little bit too long in my opinion. I think there could have been some cutting out of some things, but it's just continued to build my intrigue in the world and making me more curious about what's gonna happen next. made it through part four, so only two more parts to go. And things are still going good, I would say. My general 
take away from this book is it does just feel longer than it needs to be but that could also just be my own personal preference because I like for books to be around 350 pages max below that is really great for me too and this one is just pretty long <laughs> and to me it doesn't feel like it needs to be this long but my opinion could change by the end of the book if I felt like I enjoyed getting to spend so much time with each of these characters but it just feels like all the things that are happening within a given part could have been condensed to shorter periods of time but if you're a person who wants a book to be really stretched out maybe you'll appreciate that. Part four, I feel like I don't want to spoil for you what is even like happening in part four if you want a full non-spoilery review of the book before going into it. So I will get into that and I will just put a spoiler banner up to talk about it generally. But for a non-spoilery review of part four, I guess all I can really say is that it just felt really long. <laughs> it does go back in time. It jumps back so you're getting a little more history and it just leaves me with these questions of wondering why the story is being told to us in this order. I'm wondering if there's going to be something that makes me know it was very intentional why it was being told in this order because it's very interesting how things are being revealed to you. Things that you see and you don't fully understand until much much later in the book and I'm like well why am I getting to know this now because it's just kind of making me sadder because I know the direction that the story is going to go. <laughs> so for a non-spoilery account there's really not much more I can say at part four other than it keeps me intrigued in the story. I'm still having a good time. I'm still invested in these characters, probably even more so at this part. And I'm just wondering why it's so long and why it's being told in this order. Now for some spoilery review of part four and my thoughts on it. If you've read the book, you will know what's going on. If you haven't, I will quickly fill you in on what happened in part four. In this part, you jump back in time. And again, it's told in third person, but the character you're spending the most time with is Rosario, who was Juan's wife and the mother of his child. And what I find so interesting about this part is that you you haven't known anything really about her until now in the story when you know Juan has now died. And now you're going back and you're learning about when they first met, when he was a child and her family took him in and she started spending a lot of time with him and what their relationship looked like. And when she went away from him as she got older because she wanted a life without him, but really they were still in love and then they come back into each other's lives. And it was a really cool part to see all of that. I feel like everything in this book, I'm like, I like all these parts individually. I don't know how they're coming together as a whole and I hope it's super satisfying, but it was a really nice little like love story story. It was a tragic love story because you know the whole time by the end of it like Juan is gonna die. You know Rosaria's already died at the very beginning of the book. The context of that is that she's already dead. So they're both dead and you're going back and seeing them falling in love. And so it feels so meaningless because you know the story can't go any farther with them than what you know because they're dead but it also makes it feel more impactful because it's so tragic it's so sad knowing that but it's really interesting with Juan getting to understand his powers and with Rosario getting to understand it and they have a little friend group and the people they hang out with and the things that they're doing and they're trying to access this other world and they go there frequently and then there's this other character Eddie who comes into the story which is Steven's brother Steven slash Esteban I think they called him earlier in the book I've been reading this over a very long period of time. I finished two books in between reading part three and part four. So I've kind of had to refresh myself on the story as well, just because I had to read books for book clubs and stuff. So this is just taking me a little longer to get through. But yeah, there's this whole storyline with like Eddie and he wants to kill Juan because Eddie doesn't want the order to have access to mediums slash he also kind of wants to be the medium but he wants to like kill the hierarchy of it. It's a little bit confusing. And that whole story is really interesting. And then it gets scary when he starts trying to threaten them. And then he ultimately ends up killing a lot of them, but obviously not Rosario and Juan at this point. And I thought the story was going to end, like I thought this part with Rosario was going to end with her death, since you know she dies because you already see her have Gaspar. And then they start having these conversations about Gaspar. And this is what I thought was interesting is seeing her perspective on it she was like wanting him to be involved in the order and Juan was not and that wasn't super clear in the beginning of the book like I don't think you really understood that she had that perspective it kind of seemed like they were a united front and they both wanted to protect Gaspar and like oh how tragic that Rosario died like they probably killed her and she was trying to protect her son but now you're like was she? Because you see her initial reaction when she's learning all these things, which the main thing that she learns is that the people who run this organization, the order, the three main women, come to this realization. They hear from the darkness that 
that they need the medium, which is Juan, to take over the body of the recipient, who they deem as Gaspar, when Gaspar turns 12. So they want Juan to like take over Gaspar's body. He's like, I am not gonna do that to my son. And Rosario is like, well, I guess that's gonna happen, but I can't still be with him because that's weird to be with a person in the body of your son. Like that's the path that her mind goes. She doesn't immediately go to like an absolutely no way. And that causes a lot of tension between them. And so I thought it was going to end with a little bit of a twist. Like I thought maybe Juan was going to kill her or something, but it wouldn't have made a ton of sense because then you would have wondered why Juan wondered what happened to her in the beginning, but that's not where it ended. I actually don't even remember exactly what happened as it ended because it was kind of anticlimactic, to be honest. I mean, it wasn't fully anticlimactic because it was pretty climactic when Eddie came in and killed all of those people, but it generally ends with Louise coming around, which is Juan's brother. Juan like went to go get him because he was in an unsafe country and he came to bring him here. And now Juan wants Rosario to help Louise escape to a different country. And so that's how it ended. And I'm kind of wondering too, I'm like, oh, does he like get her to another country and then he's the one who kills her? I don't know. We shall see. That was everything that happened in part four so far. Now part five is going to jump me to 1993 um, in Olga Gallardo. Don't know where that is. Um, and I'm trying to figure out where 1993 is relative in the story. So the last time we read in part three up to like farther in the timeline was 1986. And now we're jumping to 1993. So it's going to be a few years after Juan died and Gaspar is a little bit older. And I think part five is going to be a shorter part. So I'll probably just update you once I finish the book with both part five and part six. Um, and part six is going to be 1987 to 1997. So I'm going to go finish the book and then I'll let you know my final thoughts. This whole video has just consisted of me trying out very different looks. I'm just in a phase right now where I'm trying to change my hair, I'm changing my makeup looks, I'm trying different things, I don't know. If this is the first video that you've ever seen of mine, you're probably really thrown off, but I'm just trying to experiment a little more. Anyways, I finished our sheriff night. I finished it a couple days ago, but I just got back from a trip to Nashville to go see the Taylor Swift concert, which was life-changing, amazing, incredible, wonderful. If you know anything about Taylor Swift, if you're following, I was there the night that she announced the Speak Now re-record, which is crazy. I also got to see Boy Genius perform because Phoebe Bridgers was opening and she brought the boys out and it was amazing and it was everything. And I had an incredible time. And so I finished this book on my plane ride on the original way to Nashville. So it's been a couple days since I finished it, but don't worry, I took good notes and I have a lot of thoughts. Last time we checked in, I was telling you about part four, so I have part five and part six to update you on. We will start with a non-spoilery part, then I will go into spoilers for part five and part six, and then we will go back to non-spoilery final thoughts about the book, and then we will go into spoilery final thoughts about the book. So you'll be able to navigate the chapters whether you want spoilers or you do not. First up, part five and part six in a non-spoilery way. These were maybe my favorite parts of the book. I don't know if they were my favorite parts or if by the time I got to them, I was just so invested in these characters that that's why they became so meaningful to me. But I loved these parts. I loved ending the book this way. Part five was relatively short and similar to the previous part that was also short, which I think was part two. Part five reads like it could be its own little short story moment as well. I said in part four when I was going into part five, I was like, oh, part five is in Olga Vallardo or something like that. I don't know what that is. That is a character's name. <laughs> that is not a location. That's why that was not familiar to me. Uh, that's a character's name who you're getting this perspective from in this part. And they are a journalist and I'm not spoiling anything. So I won't tell you any more about it, but they're just kind of like investigating some things that are going on. And so it was very like disjointed a little bit from the book because it's just this like random person kind of piecing together some things and it was a very short little thing so that's why it kind of read like it could be a standalone short story and if there's one thing I'm taking away from this book it's that I will be reading more from Mariana Enriquez. I know she has at least two different short story collections and I once tried to read The Dangers of Smoking in Bed back in like 2020 or 2019 and I wasn't really getting into it at the time but I wasn't really reading a lot of short stories at that moment and I think now I would appreciate them more and her writing is just incredible. So I will be checking out more from her because even the pieces that feel like short stories in this, I'm like, ooh, those are so good. And then as for part six in an unspoilery way, you're closer to Gaspar in those parts. I really like Gaspar as a character. I like getting to see 
everything about him. I just like him. I like all these characters. I just got so invested in the characters in this. It's so tricky. I don't know how to tell you about it in a non-spoilery way, I guess. I thought it was great. I was really attached to the characters at this point. And I guess that's really all I have to say. So I'm going to go into spoilers for part five and part six. If you don't want those spoilers and you just want to hear my final thoughts, then you can jump to that part. But for spoilers for part five and part six, I'm going to have to reference my notes to remember because a lot happens in these parts or like a lot is explained in these parts. Not necessarily a lot happens but just a lot of pieces come together in these parts. So in part five that is set in 1993 and you're following this journalist named Olga. Olga is investigating this case because there was a mass grave pit that was discovered of a lot of bodies and at the beginning I'm like I don't know what's going on. I don't know what this has to do with the story. You don't even know that this journalist is Olga for a bit in this portion. Like you're just kind of thrown into it and a little bit confused but it becomes clear that the mass grave pit is clearly associated with the order and the these are just people who they have used for their own purposes and disposed of. I don't know if I ever told you this part yet, but there's a moment where you find out that the main women of the order have been keeping people in cages or like children in cages. Like they would get people and try to train them to see if they could turn them into the medium or just like gain more powers from them, I guess. And so they've just been disposing of people like they are nothing. And then the journalist runs into Adela's mom. And this is all these years after Adela has been missing. And so the journalist recognizes her because this was a story story in newspapers for a little bit and she's a journalist and so she recognizes her and talks to her for a little bit and that gets Olga all interested in this story of like where Gaspar is and whatever happened to Adela and the other kids who were in this house together. So Olga goes on this journey to try to find Gaspar but Adela's mom which is Beatrice slash Betty. She has different names depending on who you're asking at different parts in the story. That happens with a couple characters in this book. And um, she tells Olga that Juan marked Gaspar so that no one will be able to find him. And then you see Olga go on this journey of trying to find him and all these weird things keep happening to her. Like she'll be driving on the streets and she can get to close streets, but she can't get to the exact street and find the exact house. And she's just going through this like weird surreal experience trying to find him and then this really weird thing happens where she's on a train and there's a man without an arm who's selling pens without an arm is like a similarity to Adela which is like the weird coincidence of it all and he sits down next to her and is like you're not gonna be able to find him and just give up and then he goes away and she tries to get off the train and she falls and she almost gets hit by the train and so then she's like I'm just gonna give up so that was pretty much part five did it add a lot to the story I don't know but I liked it <laughs> I thought it was cool then in part six that takes place from 1987 to 1997 so you get a 10 year period this is following the death of Juan and you are closely following Gaspar he is now being taken care of by Louise which was Juan's brother so his uncle is taking care of him and you see him in his teenage to young adult years in this time span and it was so heartbreaking this was such a hard part to read because Gaspar is really going through it in this part he gets really depressed and it's just a really sweet bond that he forms with Louise and how Louise is able to understand him him and get him help and take care of him. He finds a therapist named Isabella who is helping out Gaspar and gets him to open up and start having conversations. He's also started to develop epilepsy, which you don't fully understand if it's like actual epilepsy or if it's somehow connected to his powers. I think it might be a little bit of both. And so he's just struggling with a lot of things. He's not talking to his friends. And then eventually he starts to get better and come out of the depression and he starts talking to his friends again. And then there's this whole portion where they just like party in the gay scene for a bit. It's the 90s, there's AIDS, people are dying. Um, and this is like the kind of stuff where it just feels like stuff that like it could have been cut out probably when I'm like, the book was so long. Like that didn't really hold a ton of significance to the greater story. It was just kind of adding some historical context and a little bit of a transition point in my opinion. And then you start seeing his friends again, Vicky and Pablo. Remember Adela is missing. So we've just got Vicky and Pablo. Vicky is now working as a nurse and she has this ability to like diagnose people really easily. So I think part of Gaspar's magicness is kind of worn off on her. It's kind of just unexplained. And Pablo starts seeing um, an older guy named Andre who is a photographer and he actually turns out to be the photographer that you saw in part one of the story which I didn't talk about in vlogging because it was such a small portion I didn't think it would really have an impact but in part one when Juan and Gaspar are on their journey they stop at a gas station and there's this photographer man and he takes a picture of them and that picture is at the exhibit and so then it's like this light bulb moment of oh 
those people are connected. Gaspar also tells Louise in this portion that he thinks his dad intentionally carved that symbol on his arm when he slammed in through the glass window, which you piece together to be true. When Juan did that, um, he that was him marking Gaspar to help protect him. That was part of it, at least. And I like how this book would do that. Like things would happen. You're like, this is brutal. What's going on? This is creepy. And then so much later, you get an explanation. You're like, oh, that's what was going on in that part of the story. It created a cool reading experience. And then the book's just about over. And like I said, Vicky's working at the hospital and Louise shows up as a patient and he's in critical condition. He has been found and his chest was cut open and then sewed back together. And inside his chest, a child's arm was placed in his chest. And this was the order trying to send a threat basically to Gaspar with the arm again, hearkening back to Adela and her missing arm which you find out was part of a ritual that went on. And oh my gosh, I forgot to tell you this. Adela was Gaspar's cousin. She was related to them. And so that's how she ended up being close to him all his life, which was another interesting, weird part. But yeah, Louise is in super critical condition. He ends up dying. And then Gaspar is getting sick of this. He feels like his whole circle of people around him are being threatened by the order at this point, which I didn't feel like was totally built up quite enough. I mean, what happened with Louise was really tragic, but I didn't feel like a lot of clear things happened, that it was clear that the order was threatening him or like really trying to find him. I felt like that could have been built up a little bit more. But anyway, he's like, I'm sick of this. I'm just going to go to them and we're going to go deal with this and get an end to it. Don't really know fully what he was intending to do there, but they end up holding him hostage there when he goes. And Esteban slash Steven is still there and he's kind of like working with them. And Gaspar knew him from his childhood and Esteban starts talking to him in this like secret language in their heads, which is like a part of the book that people can like speak without speaking and make it look like they're talking about something else. And he does that to Gaspar and he's like, I know how we're gonna get out of here. And then it's clear there's this grand plan happening. And ultimately what ends up happening is the order, <laughs> Uh, what do they even really want out of Gaspar at this point? I don't know, to be the medium, to take him to this other world? I don't know, but Gaspar gets them through the door to the other world with Esteban and then they abandon them so that they die in this other world and they're trapped there. And he ends up living out his life with Esteban slash Steven for a bit. And that is kind of how the book ends. You also find out in this part that when Gaspar was a child and he woke up and they were telling him he was in a car accident, he wasn't. That was them doing the ritual of trying to get Juan to go into Gaspar's body. And Gaspar starts to remember this. And he remembers his dad resisting it so that he wouldn't actually have to be put in his body. So that's the note that the book ends on. I guess now I'm just going to go into my final thoughts of the book as a whole. I really liked everything I read in this book. I got so invested in the characters. They feel so real to me. I feel like I really watched this play out. The writing was incredible. The atmosphere building was incredible. The horror elements of it were incredible. There were truly some really creepy things. Like some of the moments that stand out to me are when Juan gives Gaspar a box of eyelids with eyelashes on it. That was gross. And then when Louise shows up and there's the child's arm in his body, again, that was gross. Some gross body horror specifically, but also some really well done, um, like psychological horror or like real life horror of the dad trying to protect his son and how that manifested for the son and the dad differently in their experiences and trying to cope with trauma and just all of these different elements, grief that came into the story as well. I just think everything about it was really, really good, but something about it doesn't come together super cohesive for me. And I think that is just because it doesn't flow the way I'm used to with stories. Like this didn't hit the beats that I was expecting it to hit. It didn't go in an order that I was expecting it to go. It didn't leave me with the feeling of satisfaction that I was hoping to find or that books typically do. And I don't know if that is an effect of this is a translated work originally from an author from a different country. And so maybe that is like a convention of their style that is just unfamiliar to me. And so that's why it doesn't feel like what I expect to feel at the end of a book. Like sometimes I'll be watching a movie. I feel like this happens more with movies is why I'm talking about movies instead of books. But sometimes I'm watching a movie that's like a more artsy movie and I love everything about it. And it's got me in this moment of suspense and I love the way it looks and I love the way it feels and I love the story and the characters but at the end I'm like oh what was the point <laughs> and I feel like this book kind of did that like it took me through this journey with these characters and I loved everything about it but it didn't leave me with the feeling of resolution that I was looking for and I don't fully understand why that is like is that a me thing is it supposed to do that I don't know 
I'm very curious to explore more. So that's something I want to read more about in this book on reviews or like if you've read it, let me know in the comments what you think about that. But clearly this is a very talented author. This was a very well put together story. I got so invested in every aspect of it. It's just not quite what you would expect. Like I, I heard people mention vampires related to this book and like it's not a vampire story in the way that you would think. Um, it's not a cult story in the way that you would think. It is a story about exploitation. It is a story about complex familial relationships. It is a story about found family. Ow. <laughs> uh, it's a big one so it hurts when this book hits you. But yeah I mean it's great. It's just not exactly what I was expecting but I love what I got out of it. There's a couple things that I feel like remain as a little bit of loose ends for me, or maybe I just missed small points, but things that just feel a little bit unresolved, like what did happen to Rosario? And I find it interesting that that never really came back up in the story or that we didn't really get closure in that aspect of it. I also kind of expected more historical context on the order and the cult. I'm not mad that we didn't get that, but I just kind of would have thought that we would have gotten a little bit more context around some of what was going on or like getting those characters, not perspectives, but like getting closer to those characters to understand where they came from, I think would have been interesting. Overall, I had a really good time with it. I really think it was well done. I'm definitely going to be reading more from this author. And for a longer looking book that intimidated me, it was so easy to get through. It was so easy to read. It was so good. <laughs> So that's it for my final thoughts on our share of night. Let me know down in the comments below if you've read this book and what you think about it, what your favorite parts are, or if there was anything that didn't gel with you and we can discuss that down below. Or let me know if you have not read the book, if you are now interested in reading it and if I convinced you to pick it up. Yeah, just let me know all the thoughts down below and we can chat about it there in the comments. And that is it for me. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you all in my next video. Bye.